For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. We continue our Red Letter series. Red Letter is a reference to the words of Jesus. In many Bibles, His words are recorded in red letters. Now, all the Bible is the inspired Word of God, but the words of Jesus are especially precious to us. And these words of our text are the reddest of the red. They are scarlet red. Today I want to share three of the most simple truths I suppose any preacher could share. But there are also three of the most important truths any preacher could share. Very simple, very important words. But these truths have the power to change a life, to change the world. These truths are intended for every person, no matter their gender or their geography, their race or their place. These words are meant for you and me. God has written us a love letter, and here it is. And the first point from this text is God loves. And I'm so happy that I can report that to you today. There is a God, and He is a God who loves. And yes, He loves you and me. For God so loved. We don't have the spiritual capacity to explore or understand the depths of God's love. Everybody I'm talking to has underestimated the love of God. Now, we can try to understand His love, but we will always fall short. And as a preacher, the difficulty of preaching from this text is you know you cannot do it justice. It's a mountain too high to climb. It's an ocean that could never be crossed. It's a depth and dimension that could never be fully explored. It's a revelation of truth that can never be fully comprehended, much less communicated. So the temptation is to leave it to others who are more intellectually insightful, more spiritually developed, more gifted in communication. But my hope is if we can just review the most basic truths here, it will certainly do our hearts good. It will remind us that God is for us, not against us. That His love endures forever. His love never fails. It will remind us that He has made a way where there seemed to be no way. He has provided an answer for our sin and our separation. Jesus came from heaven with a message, and the message is, for God so loved. Now, the translators try to find a way to convey this special love. The Greek word uh, for love here is agape, and this word agape was a special word. It spoke of the love of God. It's unlike any other love. It's pure and holy and sacrificing and serving and selfless. So they added that word so to intensify its meaning. God so loved. The little words are the big words. The little words are the words that bring home the truth, that clarify and intensify. And this tiniest of words, this two-letter word, augments and expands and elevates. This word takes us from the human to the divine, from the earthly to the heavenly, from the temporal to the eternal. He so loved, he so loved so much. 
Then a second lesson from this great passage is that God not only loves, but God gives. God is a giver. You know, love is seen by the action it takes. Words mean little if they're not backed up by action. And God has certainly taken action and performed in a way that is in keeping with this agape love. He has demonstrated His love in the action He has taken. The action to rescue and redeem fallen man. And what has that action been? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He gave His best, He gave His beloved, He gave His Son to be our substitute, to take our place, to purchase our eternal redemption. Now, the Apostle John wrote this gospel. He also wrote the last book in our Bible, the book of Revelation. And Revelation has all this highly symbolic language and speaks of the seals and the trumpets and the bowls of God's wrath. And the totality of some people's theology, their understanding of God, is based on the Old Testament and and the book of Revelation. But keep in mind, John not only wrote this gospel, he not only wrote the book of Revelation, but he also wrote three little epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And in those epistles, he effusively declares the love of God. For example, in 1st John chapter 3, verse 16, John writes, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. In chapter 3 of verse 1 in 1 John, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 11, he elaborates on this love of God. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. What a picture of God. What a revelation of God. God is a giver, not a taker. The cross is a plus sign, not a minus sign. When you come to God, you haven't lost anything, and you've gained everything. And if God is so for us, why do so many think He is so against us? If God is good, why do so many think He is evil? If God so loves, why do so many think He so hates? It's a sin-darkened mind that ascribes to God the worst characteristic of man, His lack of love. Twisted notions of God are the lies of the enemy and the one, and ones he's been telling from the very, begin, very beginning, ever since the Garden of Eden. His lie to Adam and Eve was God's love is flawed. God is not good, and he wants to keep you from your potential. He wants to deprive you of something you should have. But no, that's, that's not love's way. That's not God's way. He only wants to keep you from that which will harm you, which will deceive you and separate you from His love. The proof of God's love is in what God has given us. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. You know, I I marvel that there are university professors who try to tell us that Jesus Christ never claimed to be God. Now, I know I've mentioned this before, but I'm still irritated by it. 
I mean, it's one thing to say that Jesus isn't God, but it's even a greater leap into intellectual absurdity to say that Jesus never claimed to be God. Why, just look at our text. This is Jesus speaking of himself. Speaking of himself as, uh, in verse 16, God's only begotten Son. Verse 17, His Son. Verse 18, the only begotten Son of God. So apparently these scholars whose uh, walls after walls and line with shelf after shelf displaying book after book need to read a little more. And I would recommend the Gospel of John. Time after time, Jesus claims to be the one and only Son of God. All through this gospel, he says things like, He has the authority to forgive sins. He is the bread of God come down from heaven, and he gives life to the world. It is the Father's will that everyone looks to the Son for eternal life. He even said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will never die. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. When he claimed to be the fulfillment of Isaiah's messianic prophecy, the crowd well understood what he said, and they, they intensely disagreed. In fact, they tried to throw him over a cliff. They understood exactly what he was saying. When he said, before Abraham was, I am, his enemies understood what he was saying, his claim to being eternal, and they picked up stones and they tried to stone him to death. When he rebuked the Jewish leaders for their failure to believe in him and embrace him and his claims, they again picked up stones to stone him. Jesus said, I have shown you many great miracles from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? And they replied, we are not stoning you for any of these, but for blasphemy, because you claim to be God. Oh, yes, he did. And oh, yes, he is. God loves. God gives. And thirdly, we see that God saves. These all important, all important and beautiful words. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. There are two designations, two categories specifically mentioned. Two groups of people that Christ was sent to save. If you don't fit into one of these groups, he can't save you. If you do fit into one of these groups, then you are one who is qualified for his gift of eternal life. And these two categories are, first of all, the world. For God so loved the world. I've been thinking about our world a lot lately. This world stopped in its tracks by an invisible universal foe. This suffering world, this wounded planet, this broken gem of his creation, this poor, plagued planet, third from the sun. God loves this world. A few weeks ago, it was hard to imagine such a pandemic that we were experiencing coming so quickly and spreading so swiftly and altering our lives so deeply. People have been stunned by it. Many have asked, where is God? Does He care about this world? In fact, some claim to have heard God's voice and have suggested that this virus has been a judgment from God. I've heard people say, this is God judging, judging the Jews, judging the church, the Catholics, the Protestants, judging the gay community, judging the Norwegians. I just made that one up. 
Do you know what? I keep going back. I keep being drawn back to this text. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. God has too much invested in this planet to walk away from it. You say, well, the world has been so unaccepting, but that's always been the world. Don't forget this has never been a world that has given God a warm embrace. In fact, it's pictured in the opening verses of John's gospel as a world hostile to God, a world rejecting His Son. He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. God has always loved a sinful, undeserving world. While we were yet sinners, God commended His love toward us. For God so loved the world, and if you're part of this world, God loves you. There's a second word to describe those Christ came to save, and that's whosoever. That whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. All the whosoever's in the world. The Jewish whosoever's, the Gentile whosoever's, the red whosoever's, the white whosoever's, the rich whosoever's, the poor whosoever's, the male whosoever's, the female whosoever's, the somebody's, the nobody's, anybody and everybody. So just as there are two words to to describe those for whom Christ died, there are also two words to describe their condition that required His coming, that describe the condition of those who are without Christ. And the first word is the word perish. And that's not only the current condition, but also the eternal condition and destiny of the lost. This is a spiritual death. Physical death is the separation of the soul from the body, but spiritual death is the separation of the soul from God. And it's a painful word and a hard word to look at, but it's a real word. And there's no reason to leave it out or to run from it or to de-mythologize it. No reason to dismiss it as just being part of the apocalyptic expectations of an ancient people held captive to religious superstition. No reason to soft-pedal it or sugarcoat it. Not when God has so clearly spoken. Yes, spoken in red-letter words. He came that we should not perish. He came to rescue the perishing, to intervene in their behalf, to save them, to give them eternal life. And the second word used to describe those who are without Christ is is the word condemned. Condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already. So Christ didn't come to set up the condemnation of anybody. He came to save those who were already condemned. He came to save the lost. And the fact is, we were all lost. So the world and all the whosoever's of the world stand condemned, but all the whosoever's of the world can be saved. What Jesus did on that cross is sufficient to save anybody and everybody who will trust in His finished work. It cannot be more simple. It cannot be more direct. It cannot be more true. God loves. God gives. And God saves. And I am convinced that God still loves this world. And we, His church, have been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this to be stewards of that very message. Let's hear it again. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son 
that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for the simplicity and yet the unattainable truths of your word. I thank you for the reassurances of this text and for the responsibilities of it. And I pray that the church will hear it and respond in obedience. I pray that the lost will hear it and respond in repentance and that all of us will see and rejoice in the sufficiency of our God and His ability to save to the uttermost. And today, Lord, we respond to the invitation of Your Word. We respond to the open arms of our Savior extended on the cross. We respond to the invite of the Holy Spirit to look to Christ as our one and all, our Lord and our Savior. And we thank You today for the unfailing and unchanging truth of the eternal Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen.